This episode of Cello Chat is brought to you by Carriage House Violins of Johnson String Instrument. Please visit us at www.carriagehouseviolins.com. This episode of Cello Chat is brought to you by Carriage House Violins of Johnson String Instrument. Please visit us at www.carriagehouseviolins.com. From my studio, which happens to be Paul Katz's old studio. So um, I think that's of interest to Cello Bello fans. And I'm certainly hoping that some of the uh, good old vibes from when Paul taught in here are still bouncing off the walls here. I hope for that every day when I walk in. Um, so anyhow, that's that's fun. And um, for um, today's cello chat, um, I thought instead of it just being general, that I would at least start off with a little topic, something that I have been thinking about a lot with my um, students here at Eastman, um, and just in general for myself too. Um, uh, but not to exclude any other topics if people wanted to discuss them a little late in, in the hour. So for the first oh, 20 or 25 minutes, I thought maybe I would talk a little bit about some thoughts about the bow hand and specifically about the hand, the right hand, not so much the whole arm, although we could certainly talk about it if people want to. Um, now, the reason why I sort of think about this a lot is not only because I spend a lot of time teaching the cello now and I have to think about all those things, but I was thinking back to my own growing up and when I was a younger cellist, and I have to admit that working on my bow arm was not always my most favorite thing to do. I mean, of course, I wanted to become a better and better cellist, so I worked on it. But for me, somehow it was easier to like to measure my progress when, when I was thinking about my left hand work. Like, oh, how does my vibrato sound? Oh, I can get this shifting more accurate. Or by practicing double stops, I get this. And you know, my intonation, um, I was always paying attention to that. Um, so um, somehow it was like, it was more measurable to me, my progress and, um, uh, the right hand seemed more mysterious. And on top of that, my right hand was not comfortable. <laughs> so maybe that's actually why I should have worked on that more. But, you know, we'd like to work on the things that we feel progress on. And if it feels yucky, because sometimes we actually avoid it, which I definitely try to address now. And when I help my students and in my own self is like the things that are uncomfortable, the things that I should actually work on the most. So my students now know, for example, that if they say, I feel so uncomfortable playing hide and D and they know that's the next piece we're going to work on. Um, <laughs> so they know better than to admit things to me now. I'm just that, just kidding about that, but it, but it is kind of true. So the thing that, um, that, that I want to talk about today is literally holding the bow. Um, because I find that in many ways playing the cello, uh, when you pay attention to position, and holding posture, some of those things, it makes it so much easier or not so easy to, depending on how how uh, how things how you're looking at things, it makes it so much easier for you to accomplish the things you want to do to play the cello. Um, so, for example, something I've heard over the years is people change the terminology more to bow hold rather than bow grip. When I was little, little bow grip was sort of, sort of the standard terminology, and now people talk about the bow hold. A Lot more because you don't want to grip the bow you don't want to squeeze the bow it results in bad things happening it makes it more difficult like i said to do the things you want to do to play the cello and make a beautiful sound and manipulate the bow um so i specifically want to talk about holding the bow and in a sense i guess you could say hand posture um with the right hand so uh and i thought of uh, as far as organizing sort of my comments i would first talk about a little bit about you know like what my hand is able to do what it's meant to do and then what i want it to do in, in, in as far as playing the cello because it's a matter of putting those things to two things together is what makes for me uh, an effective bow hold and by extension bow arm um so if i if i if i look at my hand for example i can see that like um, there's so many joints in there, right? I mean, more joints than anywhere else on my body, practically in a close space. And that's why the hands are so useful for doing, you know, fine motor things, picking up delicate things or moving things or controlling things. And so that's uh, one thing that I'm going to think about in terms of like creating a bow hold or creating my bow hold is like, how can I use that property of my hands? It's like all those joints, they're made to bend, right? So that's the first thing. Um, uh, 
another thing is like, what are the what are the motions that I want it to be, be able to do besides just bending, right? So um, that gets into the second area of like, what do I want my bow hand to do? So here's the thing that's for me is kind of hard about the bow. If I just handed a stick to if to you or to myself and said, hold on, hold on to that. I probably wouldn't hold it way at the end. I might, but more possibly, I'd probably grasp it in the middle and I would just grasp it in my hand and I would pull the fingers together too, because then I wouldn't let go. So the problem is in order to be able to move all the joints, that's not a very good thing to do. Like my joints are pretty much stuck when I do that. So I have to find the way to hold the bow so my joints can move if I want them to move. And I, I'm going to go ahead and make a, a, a premise that I want them. I, I want my fingers to be able to move my, my, my finger joints, right? Um, so the first thing that, that I think that, that happens, and this is primarily why I was so uncomfortable with my bow when I was younger, is that there's a tendency for what the thumb and the fingers to do to oppose each other. And and I didn't want to drop the bow as a little kid when I was little and I, I squeezed it, right? So how can I hold the bow and not squeeze it is the first thing, right? And also, how can I hold it in such a way that my fingers are going to bend? So the thing that I'm going to focus in is my fingertips. Because if I'm holding the bow with my fingertips, then my joints are free to bend, right? And also, I think I'm going to I'm going to feel a little less like squeezing it. If I hold it more deep in my hand, I'm going to, right? Okay. So um, for me to hold the bow in my fingertips, my finger, without squeezing too much, my fingertips have to feel like pretty secure, right? I'm not holding the bow with a lot of my fingers. I'm not, I don't have it there in my fist. So uh, finding a stable spot for each one of my fingers is the first thing I need to do um, with, uh, with the bow hold. Okay, so and I'm going to go ahead and say my thumb is the hardest one to position because it's the only one on the back side of the bow and it's also the strongest finger. So kind of whatever the thumb does is going to be kind of whatever the what is going to be what the other fingers do. It's kind of like the ring, the kid who's kind of the ringleader of the of a, of a little band of kids. Right. So um, so for me, first of all, to find a spot where my thumb, uh, this is hard to do with the zoom camera, right? Where the thumb is not going to be locked, right? And it's uh, and the space that I use is the little. Oh boy, I get to rehearse this here. So the little spot where the frog meets the stick and the thumb leather is kind of there too. It creates a nice little canyon. By the way, finding my the spots for my fingers to me feels a lot like rock climbing because when you see a good rock climber, you can't really tell. Somehow they're stuck on the wall there, but you can't tell what they're holding on to. And holding the bow is sort of like that, especially finding the spots for your fingertips. So anyhow, so that's the first one with my thumb. And I really want it to be bent because if my thumb is straight like this, you can see it's kind of pushing in the, in the wrong direction as far as holding the bow. And it's just going to push against my fingers. So I want my thumb more like this, more underneath the bow. Well, <laughs> it's hard. Okay, right? So that's going to be and supporting the bow this way too. So because if if I, my bow hand is above the bow like this, then then I have to squeeze it to to hold it and not drop it. So supporting the bow is 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 good like this, and also for another reason which I'll say later. So the thumb underneath the stick, as well as finding a stable spot there where the frog meets the stick. Okay, so now this is easier to see on the on this side. My my fingers, in order for them to bend freely, I don't want them extra spread or extra pressed together. So normal normal width. And then luckily the frog is like, that's like the rock face for at least these three fingers, right? So I need to find a spot for each of them to sort of perch on the rock. And so um, for me, my middle finger, a nice spot is like where the ferrule, the metal meets the hair. Okay, again, there's a little corner there, so it helps stabilize my finger. Otherwise, if just anywhere or in the air or whatever, it's hard for me, like there, it's hard for me to feel my fingertip on it. Uh, for me, my ring finger, sort of, there's a little swale in the in the frog and it kind of kind of can set in there. Um, my pinky, some people put their pinky on top to help get it stable, but for reasons that I'll explain later, I like to let it go over the edge. I think it's a little bit better. It's a little bit harder at first, but there's a little ridge where the where the stick and the frog kind of meet, and that's a good spot for me. Okay, but a good rock climber can find any 
any spots there. And that's the beauty of the frog, besides it's part of the machine or the bow. It's like a handle for my right hand. Now, the only finger that doesn't have a spot for the fingertip is the index finger, right? So, so it's on the first joint and it just has to perch there on the stick. Okay. Um, for this reason, for a couple of reasons, I don't find it helpful when my hand drifts up, the fingers drift up too far like this, because then there's less things for my fingers tips to hold on to. And so that's therefore my fingers are, my joints are not going to be able to be as free, right? So sometimes that happens to people. And the other thing is, then your thumb gets stuck back in your hand more, and then that straightens the thumb. And then again, can't bend as much, right? So something like this. Now everybody's hands, different proportion, different lengths of fingers. So it might look a little different. That's why I said you gotta kind of just feel your way around that rock face of the, of the frog and find stable spots for your fingers. And like I said, especially for your thumb. When your thumb is stable, it makes much easier for the other fingers to not feel like they're pushing too much, okay? Then, then having held the bow this way, right? Now I'm gonna see which way my fingers can bend. So now they can bend, because if I hold the bow like the way I used to hold the bow with my thumb more straight and pressed against my fingers, now the bow is actually touching this part of my fingers, not the tips. So I might as well not even have these joints here on the end. This is hard to do. I should have practiced with like a backwards camera and zoom. It's super hard <laughs> to figure out how I'm doing things. Anyways, um, so, so, uh, Right, so if, if if my fingers are in this position, then then now now the fingers are, can can wiggle, all the all the joints can wiggle, right? If I was this way, my fingers straighter, my thumb pushing against the fingers, uh, can't really do anything. I'm trying to trying to make my fingers wiggle. Now now they can wiggle, right? So that's why the hold is so important. Now one additional thing besides holding the bow at the fingertips that's important to get the finger to be able to move is I want them to be able to move in the right direction. Right. And that this has to do with now thinking about the other side of it, like what do I want my bow to be able to do. So the things that my fingers are going to help the help me do with my bow are I try to make a mental list of them. One is like to change the direction of the bow. Like you can see if my fingers kind of offer like a cushion like that, it's going to make my bow changes more smooth. Right. Also, if I can manipulate the bow up and down, you can see it's going to help my bow uh, with string crossings, make that smoother. Okay. Um, uh, there's a couple of other things that, um, that, that are helpful too. It's their steering. I'll show that in a minute. Right. And there's also articulation and that's related to, to this. Okay. But those two things, changing the bow and changing the string, being able to do both of those things for me to be able to do that. Well, it helps at me at least to be a little bit pronated. In other words, leaning a little bit into the index finger. Right. So, so that this motion is kind of diagonal. I can get this motion back and forth and I can get this motion up and down. If I'm too perpendicular, it's hard for me to get back and forth. I can get up and down really well. If I were over pronated, I can't, can't, uh, can't cross the strings, although maybe I could do some with the bow changes, right? So finding a little bit of pronation helps. So here you, you'll be able to see what happens now. And as far as a way to practice the, the, the freedom of the fingers, so I was taught the, this Cole motion that I think a lot of cello teachers use, but there's a lot of ways to address it. This is a good one. So if I do my Cole motion, I won't get I won't get too into the technicalities of Cole for it right now because I just want to show the basic bow hold and how it affects playing the cello. So now you can see it's kind of operating in a diagonal motion. So I try to make if I practice Cole in the air, I try to make my bow so it can go diagonally. So it goes right to left, but also up and down at the same time. So let me show that on the cello now, which will make more sense. So, so here's back and forth finger motion. And here's string crossing finger motion. And in fact, my string crossing motion, I'm going a little back and forth too, because you can hear I'm making some sound. So I kind of want to be able to do both at the same time. And that's why the little bit of pronation I find is, is quite helpful, okay? But none of that happens as again, as I said, without having a good stable uh, hold on the bow with your fingertips, right? Except for the index finger, which is a little bit up. Like I said, the, there's no handle over there for the, maybe someone needs to invent a bow that's got a little spot for your index finger. You can in increase the flexibility of your index finger too. Um, Okay, so that's kind of um, 
how how why the the hold of the bow is really important because it allows some of those things to happen. So um, now I want to get into just a little couple more thoughts of what I'm trying to get my bow to do. Besides, as I mentioned, the first two things are change the bow and change the strings, so change the direction of the bow, change the string that I'm playing on. Um, uh, so, so with this cole motion that people practice as an active motion, I practice as active motion. It's actually for the string crossings and for the bow changes, a passive version of that motion is actually what you want. So, so in fact, besides cole, I also pra I would practice like this, like pushing against the bow and seeing what hold, keeping my fingertips stable and see what see what happens because when I change the bow. That's what's actually happening is I'm changing the bow and then I'm pulling gets it. My, if my fingers are loose, it allows the whole motion of the bow change to slow down. Like when my arm changes is different time. It's like a wave. So it is a different, slightly different time than when my fingers change. And that little mushiness of the change is what allows it to be fluid. And same thing with, bow, uh, with, str with, string, with string crossings, right? Allows it to be much more fluid. Okay. So, uh, it's important to practice the passive version of cole for those for those things, but the active version of cole. In other words, when I here's my cole motion when I practice it, that's really important because that sort of turbocharges my articulation. So when I go, if I want to make a, a, a stroke with tons of energy, a front energy, and sort of that hard consonant sound on the articulation, that's 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 finger. Uh, if I do it with my arm. I think you can hear, well, hopefully you can hear, it depends on how good my microphone and internet connection is. You can hear there's even more energy when I use my fingers as part of that. But that's an active version of using the fingers, okay? Right? Um, and that, uh, so, so I just want to differentiate between that, that motion of the fingers, the passive one and the active one. And then how, how you control that active one, you can, it gives you an infinite array of uh, articulations that you can control. That's that's how you can get everything from a hard K sound, starting a sound, to a more of a D sound, right, or an M sound. Like you want to make all the same sounds that you can make with your voice, basically with the cello. Um, so uh, uh, the fingers, having the fingers be free, is a huge, huge resource for that, and being able to move them, right? Okay. So I just wanted to mention one other important, uh, two actually two other important. Um, bow control things that are allowed if you hold the bow, in my opinion, with it's it's easier to do, I should say, with a with a, a bow hold that focuses on finger control and finger movement, right? So one thing is steering the bow. And this is why I remember earlier I mentioned that I, I'm a little more fan of a pinky being a little bit down, because then I can pull my frog this way. And the, the ability to turn the bow like this, or another way you can see it is if you if you do like a seesaw motion and you let the bow face hair face to your left and you let the bow fall in front of you so you you, you should be able to feel how the pinky and the index finger oppose each other and the thumb is that kind of a fulcrum in this in this seesaw motion right and if i use that in this in the bow playing position now i can steer the bow so i can put my uh, tip down or i can pull it back up by using my index finger and and pinky that way and so that steering is how you control contact point for me so for example if i if i draw the bow with my my tip down that's going to drive the bow to the to the bridge and if it's a little bit not so much that will come off so I, the one i really like is tip down of course because i'm always kind of trying to work the contact point but you can pull off the contact point too if you like but just by steering and that can be done just with your with your pinky and index finger this way, and especially easier if the pinky is on on the bow. So I'm not a fan of pinky up or tea party position. You're not really taking advantage of your pinky when you do uh, pinky's power when you do that, right? Um, steering the steering the bow is is wow. That's where all the color happens in playing the cello. So I think that's a huge one being able to and you want to steer the bow. Um, with your fingers. If you can do it with your fingers, it keeps you from having to do kind of funky things with your wrist or elbow or even shoulder, right? You, that you want this to be re um, relaxed and your power plant almost and have the steering be done where it can be done more efficiently, which is, which is with your fingers.
right? Um, the other thing that um, yeah, I think I find very helpful is being able to control the amount of hair that's on the string. And this is another big one that, 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 that I didn't take advantage of nearly enough when I was younger. Um, because not only can you change the color of the sound and the feeling of resistance, but the bow even behaves differently depending on if your hair is flatter, flatter, right? That's totally flat. You can see this. The camera's got a good angle on that or at an angle, right? And uh, I'm sure many of you that play regularly mm. have noticed when you when the when the bow hair is flat, your bow stick gets so much stronger, right? It feels like your stick is quite weak when it's on the side. So that can really help you if you're trying to get different quality of sound or even get your bow to behave differently. And for, for that matter, bowing, bowing like a, a bounce stroke or say a ricochet. Your ricochet is much more effective when your flare hair is flat, in my opinion, because the bow, you get the natural strength and resilience more there compared with it's on the side. So um, so back to the bow hold and how that happens. So if, if I'm holding with my fingers, I can roll the bow much more like this. If I'm holding it with this part of my, my old fashioned grip, how I played when I was younger, then to, to, to change the amount of hair, I have to do something quite awkward with my arm or my wrist, right? But now I can now I can I can control that with my fingers too, and that is very very useful. Um, so, can you play the cello well? Uh, like, do you have to have a perfect bow hold to play the cello well? And the answer to that is most definitely no, because um, I had tons of fun playing the cello even before my bow hold was maybe not quite as efficient as it is now. Um, uh, can I do some of the things I want to do now more easily with a with a better, more organized and more strategically sort of designed bowl? Yes, I think so for sure. Um, and I, uh, but I just want to put that out there because it's not like I don't want to put the cart before the horse. Making music is still what I want to. That's what excites me about playing the cello, not having a perfect bow arm. But if my bow work makes it makes me more excited to play the cello and makes more things possible or more easy, then I'm definitely up for that. Um, so that's why it's an important thing for me. And that's why it's an important thing to work on uh, if you're a teacher or a student, in my opinion. Um, so I could go into a lot more of that uh, if I wanted to, but I don't want to spend all the time just talking. So if you guys have some questions or comments about that i definitely want to address that and i see there's a whole bunch that have happened already in the chat um so let me let me let me handle the bow questions first since we're on topic how do i keep my thumb relaxed try, try like, yeah the thumb is the hard one right we talked about that the thumb is the um the strongest finger right so it's the one that just will naturally push even when you don't think it's pushing it's pushing it's like a, it's got tons of muscles behind it so for me being curved is one important thing and not pushing oh boy okay got it i should rehearse with the camera again not pushing this way into the bow because if i'm pushing this way into the bow it's not helping my bow arm anyway that's just going to make my bow crooked like this and it's going to encourage as i said to encourage my finger other fingers to push back against it Right. So to relax it, I want to put it in a totally different direction. So it's kind of like, for me, it's kind of like underneath the bow like this. Right. So now it's not pushing against the fingers so much. And it's more just supporting supporting the bow. It's like the bow is hanging off my thumb. Right. I can almost kind of hold the bow with my thumb only. And then I put my so that's a good litmus test. If your thumb is kind of in this position, it's not going to be in a pushing position. So that'll help it relax more. Right. The other reason why it's nice to, to have the thumb underneath, I don't think that you should need your thumb to kind of do much of anything at the lower part of the bow. It's kind of passive for me. Right? Where it starts doing something, but again, even here, I want to try and have it do something in a passive way is in the upper half of the bow. And if I, if I sort of draw my bow upward in this kind of U-shaped, and my thumb is underneath the bow like this, my thumb is going to naturally, just because it's going with my arm, drive the bow upwards. Right. If I if my frog end is driving upwards, that's keeping weight down in the tip. So so let's see how I do a little lift here at the upper half. So, but my thumb is not sideways; it's underneath. Then the, it's going to drive the bow up, and so that for that reason also, it's very helpful to have the thumb underneath the bow. So I would look for a thumb position that um, does not involve like sort of. This kind of pushing 
kind of position. That might help you relax. But boy, relaxing the thumbs actually on the left hand too is one of the big challenges of playing playing the cello easily. So, um, so I'm with you there. I think about it every day. <laughs> How? Um, let's see. Here's another one about the bow. How close is opening the arm when playing passages that are less noodle, so it's too noodle. Okay, so so now we're talking about um, the arm, and I was sort of just talking about the ha hand part of it. So as I said, if if my hand is is based on finger flexibility and being able to turn the bow and manipulate the bow in all these ways, hopefully my arm will have to do less of that, right? So for for example, we well, and and the interesting thing is when I was younger, more of the discussion with my teachers was getting my arm to be flexible. So for example, opening the elbow to keep the bow straight in the upper half, uh, my wrist being flexible so that so that the bow would be smooth in the lower half, right? Not too much on my shoulder. I had to work on that. Actually, Paul Katz is the one who corrected some of that for me or opened my ears and eyes to some of that. Um, so, but my feeling is that once the hand is, if the hand is like doing a lot of this work, then hopefully that allows my, the rest of my arm to be as efficient as possible and concentrate purely on getting the, the mass and energy of my core out to my hand, right? <laughs> So the amount of form opening that's used, I mean, to be honest, it also depends on how tall you are, how long your arms are, what it's going to look like. It's going to look really different from a short person and, long, and then a tall person. But I'm just going to basically open my arm, shoulder, elbow, and, well, to a certain extent, wrist. Not so much wrist out here, but my shoulder and my upper arm, just as only as much as I need to. Like, of course, I don't want to be locked ever, any joint, but I only want to move it as much as possible. So... Um, so I would say, Robert, your question, you kind of have to look at yourself in the mirror because I have no idea how long your arm is stuff, but like, uh, see, how, see how much you need. But the, um, I think you're talking about like, um, that sort of passage. So I'm using my fingers to do a lot of that work for the articulation. And for that matter, even the upper half, the energy of the sound there. So I'm doing kind of what was talked about there. Uh, I'm only gonna move, open my arm only as much as I have to, um, which could be, like I said, it could be a little different depending on how tall you are. Um, let me see if there's any other, um, what, uh, here's another one. Adjust the location of your thumb given different bows between a shorter or longer hair status on the same stick. Um, well, so, so Jeffrey, I think one thing that makes my thumb feel different is a different uh, on a different bow is the shape of the frog actually so some frogs have like kind of like sharp corners on them and some are rounded maybe it's been used for a number of years or something. Um, the one thing that can be different as far as the length of the hair is like the distance between the frog and the thumb le thumb leather and so that changes that little valley where i'm putting my thumb that changes sort of the feeling of that a little bit. Um, I still, because everything for me is using the frog as a handle for my other fingers, so I would still put my thumb in the same location of the frog compared to, um, compared to the fingers. Um, oh, well, the fro frogs can be bigger or smaller too, so sometimes they're a little deeper, right? Um, I guess occasionally it could be a little longer, so it's true you might have to get used to um, things being a little differently, but, I, but for me, finding a stable location for the thumb Actually, well, I was going to say it's sort of consistent because I'm always using that corner of the frog, but I would say be a rock climber, <laughs> Ex experiment. I, I, I sort of like don't like saying like there's one spot to hold the thumb or there's one way to hold your arm. Like we're all kind of different. So for me, the important thing is the principle, which is finding stable spots for all my fingers to rest so that my fingertips are stable and located. That makes it possible to have motion in all the joints. Okay, so that's the principle I'm working with. So how you get there, it's sort of like a GPS, you know, there, there could be a lot of routes to the same location. So I would say, I would say experiment, Jeffrey. Um, okay, there's a left hand thumb there. Placing the thumb on the inside C of the frog. Oh, Russian, that's another one. So I think uh, going f even further back with the, your question is to put the thumb in the, in the little top of the little C of the frog. Um, you know, so I've never 
tried seriously playing that way, although it's fun to goof around with with stuff always. Um, uh, like I said, I think there could be, a, as I was saying a minute ago, there could be a lot of roots to the same location. If it helps you with stability, if it helps you with stability, you know, um, the one thing I will say is that puts you further back on the bow. And like I said, if you are naturally going to hold the bow, you'd probably hold it somewhere in the in the middle just to grab it the easiest possible way. So it does make your bow feel heavier the further back you go and the tip feel further away. So I, you know, probably again, depends a lot on the length of your arm and stuff. Um, I'm not too dogmatic about like where it's, it's just the idea of, like I said, stable spots for your fingertips so that your fingers can move and then getting them to move in the right direction so that they accomplish the job that you want. Um, uh, when you play the cello. Guy, hey guy, how are you doing? <laughs> My colleague from Eastman, thank you for watching. He's got so many good comments. Um, let's see, I assume all you guys can see the, uh, see the, um, see the questions that I'm seeing. Okay, so now I'll go back and look at some of the other questions here from other people. So Jihoon asks, I'm currently playing the Dachnani string Serenade tree. We can, by the way, we can come back to the bow. I'm happy to keep coming back to it since that's sort of the topic of the day. And even if you want to talk a little bit more about the arm, I was talking purely about how you hold the bow. Um, let's see. Um, but we'll do these other questions too. I'm currently playing the Dachnani string serenade trio, and I wanted to ask what are some good ways to practice rhythm, intonation, and keeping a tempo with others? Uh, hey, you, you, you're so on to some of the big keys of playing good chamber music there, Jihoon. Um, if I were to say there's one thing more than any other that helps you feel more connected with the people you play with, um, is it like the ability to make the same strokes, match strokes, or good intonation with each other? It would actually not be either of those things, although those are important. It would be having a good sense of common musical pulse. And the reason why I say that is because, first of all, pulse is the thing that allows you to not get lost from each other. But secondly, for me, pulse is so much the foundation of where character of music comes from. How you get from this moment to this moment in time, that's kind of like the feel of that. It's kind of like how music goes in a way, you know what I mean? Compared with that, like being in tune or matching a tone is sort of like the external things that make music sound beautiful or sound cohesive like the actual movement of in time from how do you get from this place to this place are we going to do it together we're we going to do it in the same way we're we going to do it at the same speed are we going to do it with the same energy that that's kind of at the core of playing with another music with another person for me um so i think that is a fantastic way to be thinking about practicing keeping a tempo with others that's what you say so what i would do is i would practice pulse with the other people in in my group um but not just like, okay, 86 to the quarter note, let's do it. One, two, three, four, one, right? Um, that wasn't 86, by the way, that was probably closer to one, 130. Um, but uh, uh, also trying to express the character of the music in the pulse. So is it one, two, three, four, or is it one, two, three? Um, or how important is the first beat? One, two, three, four, one, two. Or maybe the t top of the phrase is actually on the third beat. One, two, three, four, right? I think pulse could have dynamics too, besides character. It could be one, two, three, four. or it could be one, two, three, you know what I mean? So finding a way to practice the pulse of a passage, of a phrase, with your colleagues is is extremely helpful to me. Like um, literally saying what I was just doing, saying numbers together, but watching the music and trying to match the way you count with the way the phrase is going, with the character, with the dynamic, right? Um, you'll pretty quickly, when you do that, figure out, oh, that person's not counting the same way I'm counting, or we need to do this to count together. And when your counting is really together, assuming that you can then play and count at the same time, that's another important skill, um, you'll find your playing getting, I think, much more unified and not just together, like on, ensemble wise, like musically together too, right? Like artistically together. Um, 
And when you're doing that, it's, yeah, that's, that's fun. Then you're, you feel like your collective efforts are all moving in the same direction. You feel synergy from each other's energy rather than opposition. Um, and uh, so anyhow, that's, that, that's what I would recommend. One, one important thing I would recommend. If you wanna practice intonation, that's important too. But I, you know, I, would, I would work on group pulse even before uh, intonation, but intonation every day too. Um, that's good. Just intonation, just take a passage slowly or maybe even a chord, isolate it. Hear how the overtones of your pitches work together. So you'll find that, for example, moving your bow in different ways can make you appear to be kind of like out of tune, for example. So that's why if you just do a chord and kind of isolate something, you'll, you'll learn a lot about playing in tune together. And then, you know, trying to stack well, like hearing the bass as a foundation to measure, because I don't think in a group, I mean, if everybody's trying to play in tune and, and close, it's not going to be out of tune because one person's out of tune. It's because it's you're not quite hearing the same way the pitches are resonating. So I would view intonation as a group effort. So kind of um, use something as something uh, as a frame of reference. And the bass note is a very helpful to use a, as a frame of reference that way. Okay, let me just jump to another question here. That's good. Chamber music is so fun, isn't it? I'm glad you enjoy it, Jihoon. Um, let's see. Oh, when you're teaching that Kole exercise, how do you describe what to listen for? Um, so if, well, first of all, maybe I should just show the aspects of the Kole exercise. Ba basically, you're trying to get your fingers to be able to move like this. And I try to get my fingers to move independent of my wrist and my elbow and my shoulder, everything else. It's just everything from the knuckles down. So it's this motion, right? If I were just isolating what happens with my fingers. So now I'm, I'm just doing that while holding a bow. So so it looks like this. And I, I would even just practice it in the air like this. You don't even have to do it in the cello. So then you have, don't, don't have to worry what you're listening for, right? I'm just looking for my fingers to be really, to have maximum motion. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like doing yoga. Like you do maximum stretches in yoga so that in everyday life you feel nice and relaxed and mobile, right? Your, your joints and ligaments and everything, right? So that's what Kole is. It's yoga for my right hand fingers, right? So, so it's just this at first. When I do it on the string, then I'm looking, as I said, I'm looking for both motion side to side and up and up and down for my string crossing. So I'm looking for bow changes and string crossings, right? So so if I do Kole correctly, for me, this is the way I do it. I will both, first of all, I'll be able to hear a small bow stroke. And this is without moving my bow arm at all. This is entirely from my knuckles down, right? I'm not trying to, I don't know if I can do it. I can't help with my wrist. Like this. I hope the camera view angle is good enough to see. Let me just, it's a good check. I should have checked this beforehand. Be sure I'm doing it right. <laughs> okay, so I should, you should see, only see my knuckles down moving, right? And the knuckles are flat when the fingers are curved. By the way, curving your fingers is a good way to emphasize the feeling of your fingertips on the bow, right? It's not as though your fingertips, it's like your fingers never touch the bow, other parts of your finger, but I'm controlling the bow with my fingertips. And when I curve my fingers, I've, I've become more aware of my fingertips on the bow. Anyways, okay. So so my knuckles are flat, my fingers are curved. I straighten my fingers and my knuckles are actually more bent. You know? And I will hear, um, like I said, like a little bow stroke because I'm going side to side. But if I put my bow in the right place, like in other words, like sort of right between two strings, then I should be able to do Kole and cross strings at the same time. So down bow, uh, the bow is closer in my hand because my fingers are curved. I extend my fingers. That's like a down bow, moves in the down bow direction. And now I'm on the G string, right? And now when I pull the bow back into my hand, in other words, curve my fingers again, uh, I do an up bow on the G string, which brings me back to the D string level. So, so that's, those are some little tests to see if my Kole is doing what I want it to do. What the, if the, my motion, my finger motion that I'm working so hard to get my finger flexibility in motion is going in the right direction, uh, the direction that's going to help me play the cello, in other words, because, you know, just random motion is not what we want. We want the motions that are going to help us play the cello.
So that's what I'm going for when I practice the Kobe. Um, let's see here. Okay, here we go. Um, how to begin learning thumb position without creating bad habits for the left hand thumb. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, so so I think, you know, I don't think, I don't think there are going to be any habits for the thumb that are any different than bad habits that are any different for the bad habits that could be down here. So I would try and, uh, you, you, well, I have actually, okay, I'll save that thought. I do have one thought about pl playing in thumb position, um, just generally, and I, it's more of a question, actually. You, you guys could probably, many of you guys could probably answer it better than me. Um, but I, I try to observe the exact same principles up here as I do down here, right? So I want my fingers to be falling into the string this way so I don't push back with my thumb, right? Right, so I'm hanging here, right? My fingers are going to be curved more up on my fingertips because that that's, again, my, we didn't talk about left-hand position today, but same thing here. Left-hand position can encourage good things to happen in your in your left hand. If you're more extended out here, it encourages more force putting put to, to put your fingers down, so, right? So I'm here. So I'm going to try and adopt the exact same position up here. In fact, I'm kind of using my position up here as a model for down here in many respects because, like, for example, there's a little hand finger angle here. I want the same angle here, so it's just one position all the way up and down the cello, right? So um, the only difference up here is, of course, your thumb is not underneath the underneath the fingerboard. Although I, I was it Paul Tortelia that sometimes played with his finger underneath the fingerboard here, so it could vibrate better. Um, so it has been thought about, um, right? So, but even if my thumb is here, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm still going to feel try and feel weight here. I'm going to try to feel flexibility in my fingers. You can feel my the squash, so that when I vibrate, I have some flexibility in my fingers over here. Okay. And the one thing I want to do is don't. Uh, that's different with my thumbing up here, like having it. Uh, it, around the area where it's going to play is good, but having it constantly press the string down, I don't think you need to do that any more than you would keep your fingers pressed down the ones that are not playing down here, right? So I'm just basically trying to observe the same habits and practice my left hand up here the same way as I do down here. Um, so I do have my other thought that I, this is just a question that I've wondered for a long time. Like, I wonder what would happen if we always learn the challenge we play first position first we learn down here somehow it's thought to be easier. What if we learned just learned up here first and then gradually moved it back here. I just I just have always wondered that and it's too late for me to go back and try it on myself, but. Um, um, I think it would be an interesting experiment to do sometime because we sometimes we get a phobia about playing up high because it's just because we haven't done it as much. If we started up here and this were the natural thing, we probably have a phobia of playing down here. Maybe that would just be an interesting thing. And then also, um, like I said, in many ways, my hand I feel like my hand position here should be a model for my hand position down here um, because I lots of times. Uh, well, for me, I I played with my hand square for a while, like down here when when I first learned, and then. I got in here and because I was nervous about letting my thumb go, my hand got super angled here and then I'd finally bring my thumb up and then it got less angled. And I sort of think this is the best position here. And so like I'd love in seventh position to not feel like my hand is totally splayed out like that. So it wouldn't matter if my thumb were up here or here. My fingers are the exact same thing. And then same thing for down here. It doesn't matter if my thumb were up or, or back. It's sort of the same position. So that's a question. That's a question for my, myself that I want to answer someday, which can't happen unless I could go back to the age of ten and start my cello, start the cello again. Um, let's see. Do you have uh, Do you have any ideas? This is from Claire. Do you have any ideas about why my fingers, not usually my thumb, have a tendency to gradually move up the bow towards the position. Oh yeah, yeah. So we we're talking about that with the bow. How sometimes people's fingers creep up like this, right? I think I'm, I I think it's because I think why you want to do that is because when you play in the upper half, you want to try and get some weight in there, and it's easy, you get more leverage if your fingers go higher, right? Like I said, if you if you could just hold the bow the most easy way, the bow feels so light if I hold it right here. So that's why it's you know that's a kind of a natural place to play the hold the bow, except then. A hard time playing back here, I suppose, right? So, so that I think that's why your fingers might want to run up, run up there. Um, I, like I said, I want to feel if the more stable I feel from my fingertips, the less I want to, the less I want to do that. So, so that's why I work a lot on feeling the bow with my fingertips 
um, because the reason why I can run up is because I'm feeling more with up here in this part of my finger. And I just don't, basically don't have as good, there's not as much of the bow to hold on to right here, right? So it can easily slide. So if you're kind of holding the bow with this part of your fingers, it, it, it's easy, it's kind of, right? And then you're trying to probably, uh, if your fingers aren't so flexible, which they wouldn't be if you're holding this, then you're trying to get flexibility by squ um, squishing your fingers around like this. So that, that, that happens lots of times. Or sometimes people even try and get flexibility in their bow arm just by just, even if they're holding the bow kind of down here, by just letting the bow go, just letting the, letting the fingers move around. So, so anytime you're holding the bow that loose, it, you could re-hold the bow and walk around basically easily. So for me, trying to get the stability of those fingers is, is uh, the fingertips is the key and then get the flexibility out of my joints and not out of having either a loose bow hold or holding the bow with this part of my fingers, as I said, that this part of my fingers instead of out here in the tips. So I think that, yeah, the fingers just slide in a very relaxed way. That's right, because you're not, not holding the bow very tight and then you can't really hold the bow uh, you can't, there's nothing to hold on to with a stick right there. And with this part of your, if, if you are trying to pick something up and carefully something small, I doubt whether you would use the inside of your fingers here, like, like this, it's, it's very clumsy compared with using your fingertips. So, um, that's the, that's, that, that's the key for me to making, making the bowl hold work a little bit better for you, Claire. Um, maybe someday I will, oh, it's Claire's daughter. So. Your, your your daughter, Claire, maybe someday I'll hear her play in person. We can talk about it in person. But that's, um, it is a hard thing. I think that for me, the challenge is to get the fingertips to be stable so that the finger joints can move a lot. So for a lot of people, it's kind of, and me too, it's kind of the opposite. I just, I'll just let go of the bow because I'm holding it like this. Don't squeeze it so much and get my flexibility by just letting the bow slip around in my hand more, right? But the problem, and it is a certain flexibility and you're not squeezing at least, but um, you don't get much control of the bow. And so, and then doing things like being able to, to change the amount of hair on the bow or steer the bow or artic turbocharging the articulations or getting the, the string, the bow changes to happen like at a different time that the shoulder is happening in the hand. All that kind of stuff is much harder to do um, when, I'm, when I'm, you know, basically letting the bow slip around in my hand. Um, good. Hey, did I get, did I get all the, did you send any questions that I didn't answer, Will? Um, no, I think there are a couple more coming up. So, okay. Because I jumped, I was jumping around in the list a little bit. I see Guy recommends Duport number seventh, sitting number seven is a good etude for, yeah, etudes are great because they, Folk, I mean, any etude is good, great because it will focus your attention on certain motions and allow you to do them in a repeated way, um, which doesn't always happen in a, in a piece. So that's good. Uh, Jonathan, do I, do I recommend a rubber gripper on my bow? Okay, well that's, well, that's interesting. And maybe I could also uh, enlarge that to like putting surgical tu tubing on, on my bow here. So, um, there are a lot of reasons uh, there, like, okay, so when I just think about my my life, <laughs> so millions of cello teachers, not millions of cello teachers, every single one of my cello teachers told me when I was playing, don't, because uh, I was playing with a locked thumb and it was pushing against my other fingers. Like, so I think you should curve your thumb is what they said. That was just shorthand for, you know, hold the bow with your fingertips in my opinion, right? Okay. and. Uh, they were great teachers, but they were not persistent with me about this. And they, I think, because they saw I was having fun playing the cello and doing what I wanted to do. Like, uh, I don't want to ruin his fun by by forcing him to like go back to square one on the bow hold. Um, so I didn't really do it until I finally came to Leonard Rose at the age of 19. And he said, we curve our thumb on the bow. And I was like, okay, yes, we do. Mr. Rose, I wasn't about to argue with him. And for eight weeks, maybe I felt like I was a beginner again. I felt like I was going to drop the bow every time. That was when I was thinking about it. And it wasn't when I wasn't thinking about it. It was just I was back to my old habits, right? So, um, so I think that things like surgical tubing or a rubber hold can help make it easier to develop a good habit 
But the thing that I worry about with those things is that um, it, it, it's a cheat too. So for example, with surgical tubing, which I have used at some times in the past, it's so super comfy because then my thumb is like, it doesn't slip around so much, right? So I don't have to worry about it. It allows me to not use a super stable um, posture and location on my thumb and still have it not move around. So I've tried, so, so I, when I realized that maybe I should try and push myself further and find the, a stable spot without using the, the surgical tubing, I, I, I think that was a good thing. And, and uh, also it makes the bow feel thicker. So it's, it's like, you know, you don't feel the stick as well. Um, I think when you're playing and you're really connected with the stick and, and making a beautiful resonant sound, you can almost feel the bow vibrating or maybe literally feel the vibe. Like, I feel like my bow tingles sometimes when I'm really making a great sound, like it's kind of vibrating, right? And that, that's harder to feel with the, um, with the uh, tubing on. Um, so uh, I guess my, my thought about that is it's a good step towards helping you feel more comfortable more quickly. But I would also try and wean myself from it too, um, as time as time goes on, and try and find a way that I can balance the bow. Like I said, find a way I can balance the bow without, you know, without this. The tu tu tubing allows me. That's like climbing a rock wall and having like somehow magnets in your hands or something, right? So a little bit easier. And I, I kind of want to figure out how I can hold it, and 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 not need that. Um, Okay, okay. Oh, some more questions about uh, teaching a student with shorter arms, modifying the position of the child. Um, uh, uh, you know, I uh, when I teach um, students who are, are a little shorter, I teach them the exact same way because I want them to learn the principles um, that everyone is learning and not sort of like modify things for themselves. And then I kind of let them just sort of strategize. I, I, I emphasize, okay, you're going to look a little different, like, uh, but I don't want them to feel different is the thing. So I try to teach, I try to teach, well, I try to teach everybody more along the lines of what's the principle, what's the sound, of course, biggest, most important, and then what's the sensation, right? Um, and then let people to a certain extent figure it out themselves, you know? Um, Oh, of course, make suggestions. So what if you try this? What if you try this? Um, I don't think there's a, a single solution for every every person, to be to be honest. Um, sure, for sure. End pin height is something to be uh, and to be honest, I think one of the nicest things you can do if you're a smaller person is make sure you're not playing a cello that's too big. Um, I played a beautiful I tried a beautiful seven eighths cello the other day. And um, I thought it sounded great. I didn't even think it sounded particularly small. So um, I think I think that's probably a, a better thing than trying to do something different um, with with smaller people. And um, if a smaller person doesn't maybe use the last inch of the bow as frequently as other people, I think that's totally fine. I think it's totally fine. Um, yeah, I'm I'm a fan of like trying to work with yourself and figure out what it is. And I you know that's been a big part of my learning as a teacher is uh, there was one year here at Eastman where I had um, I don't have a big studio I usually only have like maybe seven or eight people um, but three out of the eight people were all guys that were six four and taller and I'm I'm not super short I'm kind of in the in between but I could not relate to a six four guy what they had what how, how their bow arm was like having to fold and finding room for it and stuff it was kind of the opposite of someone who's very short um and i i had fun with them a lot of fun it's like okay here's the idea so let's see how it can work you know so i think uh because um i think the, and it was interesting these three tall guys even though they're all tall they even were a little different because maybe some of the height was more in their torso and some had longer arms and stuff so it was very difficult to say there was a custom solution. In fact, impossible. So um, it was fun experimenting with them and getting figuring out how they could feel comfortable within the parameters of like, okay, I need to feel an impulse. I need to feel release. So how can you feel release out here? I want to feel flexibility, um, but no uh, excess flexibility, no excess folding or stuff like that. 
Um, there are some sort of like overarching physical mm, principles maybe that I would say that I kind of try and follow. So like one is like, I want every joint that is involved in playing the cello or actually every joint to feel like it's mobile, like nothing's gonna be locked. But at the same time, I don't wanna ever use anything more than I need to, right? So like, for example, uh, if I overuse my elbow, then that's gonna encourage me maybe to not use my fingers as much or my wrist specifically, actually the wrist and the elbow are very much linked. So I find that if you use your elbow too much, then your wrist doesn't move as much. Um, I don't know. So, so that's one thing that I live by. And then um, another, another physical principle is I, I try to make every motion on the cello uh, some version of impulse and release. So you're never constantly engaging muscles. Um, so, but how those things play out for different people or, or in different situations, for example, what kind of playing situation you're in or the passage or the whatever demands, I find that the solutions are constantly changing. So that's what's fun about music. It's every day you wake up and it's different. Um, let's see if we can get to a couple more of these things. Uh, the weight of the bow without using the weight of the bow without transferring to excessive pressure. This is a perfect example of impulse and release. So if I if I so I'm trying to use um, uh, the natural weight of my arm, in fact, even my torso, right? I, uh, uh, so I have to have my back loose enough to make sure my back gets into it. Like, so I don't want to hold my breath. That's why breathing is so important, right? But so for example, if I, if I choose the, uh, uh, the right way to use the, my, um, my, my, to use my body, to use my bow arm, I can find a bow path where I can, there's an impulse and then the swing of my arm just naturally is upward and suddenly my thumb is driving the bow upwards I said it as I said if my thumbs in the right position and that keeps the weight so if I kept, if I had a totally level bow arm as I got further and further out the bow I would need to twist my arm to torque my arm more and more to keep the keep the uh, constant level of weight or, or pressure into the string and so that's when I don't feel muscular release because I'm little by little you know using more and more twist in my arm or torque in my arm that way so if i find a way to incorporate like movements bow path um hand position to put all those things together so that i, I can get uh what i want to happen from a impulse and then a release standpoint that's so, so at least how the bow works that's 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 what i would do there with vibrato i try and do also one impulse and if my fans released it'll keep going for a while. So that way I don't have to constantly push my hand. Uh, 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 uh. And that helps that, that helps me get uh, this feeling of release in my my left hand too. So like like I said, every single motion on the chill, I try to turn into some version of muscular impulse and then release. So you just have to design the, the motion the right way and get your hands in the right posture so it can take advantage of what your body can do naturally. Um, and that's kind of the that's kind of what I hope for in in playing the cello for myself. I think that's gonna allow me to play into my golden years more successfully too, and I'm not overusing my muscles. Hopefully, that's the idea because I'm getting closer and closer to the golden years. Let's see. Mm, do you, Jonathan has a question? Do you play with a heavy or light bow? The white weight of the bow, the pros and cons of both. Uh, as time has gone on, Jonathan, I appreciate the merits of a well-balanced bow and one that's not overly tip heavy uh, more and more in my life. So at one time I thought, well, a heavy bow is naturally going to sink into the string more. It's going to encourage it. To a certain extent, that's true, but I'm more interested in sinking my weight into the string rather than the bow's weight into the string at this point. And the agility that you get from a well-balanced bow um is to me worth far far outweighs any any gains that would be given by uh, a few extra grams in the tip um so even more than a um, heavy bow or light bow i'm looking for a bow that's not overly tip heavy i mean it could be too light in the tip too but i've if anything i'm finding myself more distracted by bows that are too heavy in the tip and when i you know my students and i are trying bows and stuff um that's I guess I could generalize and say that my own bows are um, the low 80s, 81, 82, 
for my bows, uh, grams. Um, but the balance of it is is actually, uh, and the way it plays is is more important than the actual weight of the bow. Um, I want a bow that's going to track well all the way frog to tip. Feels like it hugs the string. Kind of feels like it almost is like burrowing into the string, even in the upper part. Um, but I, like I said again, that's uh, my my own technique. The way I use my body and my weight is has become more and more important to me than the literal grams of weight in the tip of the bow. So that's 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 kind of what I, what I'm looking for. Um, regarding bow changes at the tip, so I'm. Some teach pushing the string from below, others approach the new. Do you teach the, uh, the new bow from the high side and then roll down? Do you teach the execution of either bowing style based on the intensity of music or with more individual solutions, as you mentioned? I don't like. Um, so I'm constantly fiddling around with my own playing, and I, like I said, I kind of don't want to have any rules for myself. So myself, I've learned. I, I've tried to teach myself both of those, so I feel totally comfortable depending on the situation. So what um, uh, uh, what Jeffrey's talking about, I think, is like, so so the tip change, the, the frog change, we were talking a little bit about that, getting getting the fingers, the softness of the fingers to, to um, so so that the change happens at different times in your arm, right? So flexibility. It's, it's more difficult to feel flexibility in, in, out here, plus, um, you've got your arm, much more arm, I'm being open here, you've got more possibility with the arm. So I think quite a lot of people try to sort of make circles. And that helps make the tip change smoother, right? Instead of going bang into a wall and then 180 degrees in the other direction, more like a swimmer doing a flip turn, they get to the wall, and they use the momentum into the wall to push out of the wall, right? And the way to do that is to make it turn into a curve. They turn, they somersault. So they almost make like a little U. Cello playing is full of U's and curves, right? More than it is at hard angles. And so so at the tip, you can do sort of overhand or it might feel like um like a crawl stroke a little bit like this, right? So you you start the bow, down bow is closer to the, I'm on the D, D string. Down bow closer to the G string, up bow closer to the A string, right? So you're sort of changing out like this way. Um, you could do your flip turn backwards, and this one's going to feel more like backstroke, right? So now down bow closer to the A string, up bow closer to the G string, right? So the advantages and well, the difference to me is like where where how my weight is getting applied to the string. So if I do the backstroke one, the one that I just demonstrated. <laughs> That, that drops my weight into the string at the beginning of the up bow, kind of like a gamba player doing an up bow, right? With the, or, or a bass player doing the French, the German bow, like this, right? So, or maybe a baseball pitcher throwing sidearm, if you, if, if you relate more to that instead of backstroke. That, is, that, I've, that I enjoy doing when I need a lot of power and weight and resistance at the beginning of the up bow. So I want drag in the up bow, the same way. Like sometimes it's really nice to get like drag at the beginning of the down bow. You want that kind of like uh, tension and then release, right? Um, in the sound. So the up bow, you can you can do that too by by doing this this change in the up bow. If I if on the other hand I'm I'm doing something that's like more airy or delicate, then so then I might do the one that's more like a cross stroke or more overhand, right? Um, I think those are things that you might intuitively do if you are just listening for the quality of the sound and you're thinking, okay, my use, my curves have to be down deep in the string, or they're more shallow and they're up here, right? So um, uh, you might intuitively do that anyway, but it, you know, it, it helps to be organized, especially if you're a teacher and you want to have a pedagogy. And um, But like for me, the most important thing is that you are like engaged with the sound you're creating and it feels like communicative and and um, and so uh, once again, if 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 a student, if if you're, if you're getting the right fluidity and if you're getting the sound you want, maybe there's a lot of ways to get to that, a lot of GPS ways to get to that same same thing. But that is very helpful to think of circles when you're changing at the tip. I th I find it certainly beats just come come back 180 degrees in the other direction. It's very, gonna be very hard to make a fluid change that way. Um, let's see, I see we're a little past two, but I'm happy to keep going as long as there's still questions. 
It's fun talking to you all. Mm, Suzanne's got a, qu a question. This might be our last one, unless there's more. Can you demonstrate how you would figure out what bow speed and bow distribution to use for a phrase? Um, yeah, so, wow. Wow, Suzanne, that's like sort of a sort of a super open-ended question because every phrase is like different. Um, but let's just say I'm trying to figure out maybe some general thoughts of like how a phrase, uh, what 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 uh, all phrases would share in common. Let me think about that for a moment. I mean, so easier for me to think about the other side. Like music is so open-ended that I think every phrase should feel like its own being, its own entity, and that, and thus have a different way of playing it. And even the way you play it from day to day could be different. And for sure, different players would play the same phrase differently and should play it differently. So it's not as though there's like a, a formula that you could use to, but I will say this, like when, if I think about a phrase, well, let me start. Let me try to describe it this way. Let me see if I can come up with an answer out of it. So I think there is something about a phrase in the sense that it's a journey of some sorts. It, there's a beginning, something that initiates energy. There's something that propels energy and keeps interest aloft and maybe intrigue or maybe tension. And then there's something about the end of the phrase that at least for a small moment allows you to resolve that intrigue, right? So I would say that um, as far as what creates energy inside sound, um, that's gonna be bow speed, uh, kind of like more than anything, although vibrato has a lot to do with it too. So uh, like that, that sound has, like that sound's gotta go somewhere. That's got motion in it. That's got like energy in it, right? Um, this sound has less energy in it, so. Um, so I'm going to manipulate speed and vibrato, especially both speed and vibrato to kind of display how much energy I want into the sound and, and like, depends on how I feel about the phrase at any given moment, like more, more energy, more motion in the sound, more I have to get somewhere. And of course, this would be different if you are, so I keep thinking of the differences too. Like if you're playing a slow tempo, then what creates motion in the sound might just be Right? I mean, the differences in speed would be not very, not as perceptible, but maybe vibrato more. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm just trying to think about it. So that's why, um, well, here, let me, let me say this. I said, I don't want to be too confusing. <laughs> um, I feel like when you work on operating the t a cello, having technique, um, I feel like those should just be tools that you use almost unconsciously. So that when you play music, you can just focus on on how you want the music to come out, like how you would speak or sing it. You know what I mean? Um, and um, I suppose it's you know like experimenting and using your tools uh, allows like having a good vocabulary. You can speak more precisely. So it's good to practice technique. It's good to manipulate your technique too. And 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 so actually all these things that we've been talking about today, I would actually think about ways to practice them where you're manipulating it. Like, I wouldn't want to just have one bow speed. I wouldn't want to have many, and I wouldn't want to be able to constantly, like a car, be able to accelerate or decelerate, right? Because that's going to be ultimately what you use to to express yourself. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I would say in the middle of the phrase, you're kind of do. there's got to be some kind of energy, so one way or another, either from the intensity of the color or the depth of the the contact that when you have deep contact and you hear more e in the sound that vowel that's tension that's energy in the sound too if you take it if you take a little bit off and it gets ah e, e vowel turns into ah then then you feel repose a little bit right so so I guess it's about using those tools it's hard to say I, I don't mean to be so evasive but it's hard to like sort of generalize what you would do to create a phrase it's like you just want to dip into that toolbox and have the tools all at hand so that you're not really almost even thinking about using them you're just creating the sound the energy the speech that you that you want to um 
Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm going to think about that. I need to come up with a better answer for that. <laughs> um, oh, there's a last one from Rebecca here. With regards to the left hand articulation and fast passages, how can this just be achieved without over testing the hand? Okay. So uh, I think I can give a quick and more clear answer to this one than the last question. <laughs> so I'll try to end on a good one. Um, so for me, uh, uh, speed is much more important than force in the left hand. Okay, um, so that's the first thing I'm thinking about. So, for example, when you hear when when people play and you can hear banging on the on the fingerboard, uh, yes, that sort of increases articulation, but it's super taxing for the left hand. It also keeps you from going fa playing a fast tempo too, right? So, I try to practice some exercises where I'm using speed in my in my in my left hand more than force and i also try to think of lifting my fingers as quickly as i do putting them down okay because sometimes too much down uh downward thinking in the left hand um the energy is all down it, it creates heaviness in the in, in, in the left hand and also like i said too much force um uh and then the other thing is the other thought about that is my thought about impulse and release i want my finger as soon as as soon as it's down to immediately release so I try and practice, for example, when I put my finger down, I try and immediately follow it in when I, when I practice slowly with vibrato, because vibrato for me is a releasing, that's a releasing emotion, right? That's an impulse and a release, as I was trying to demonstrate earlier. So that encourages me not to put my finger down and then keep it jammed down. So it's like, it almost feels like my fingers are bouncing or rebounding every time I put them down, right? So I do that slowly so that when I play um, faster, that my fingers have that kind of light, fast energy and lots of release for every impulse. Um, also, it's not a bad, terrible thing to in a, fa in a moderately fast passage to be able to vibrate any note that I wanted to within the passage. So being able to have a very quick releasing from vibrato every time I put down my fingers is... Um, is helpful in that way too. Just as another musical tool for I want to sing this note in that passage, or I want to like linger on that note just a little bit. Um, so those those are a couple of things that I think about in terms of. But number one number one thing is speed over force. That, that's a big thing because I um, I know myself I I overused force for sure, and that's also related to the thumb. If your thumb pushes back too much. Uh, and you're and you're getting the stringers down by more of this clothespin action as opposed to just up and down, right? Then that's going to um, result in slowing slowing your hand down and that actually um, also tiring it out and ultimately not having as good articulation in the end too. Um, so anyhow, okay. On that very practical but technical note, it's great spending the hour, and thank you, Will, for your help too. And uh, hopefully we'll do this again sometime. If, always feel free to, if there's something that I was unclear about or you want to continue a discussion, feel free to you can email me. Go to Eastman School of Music uh, website. You can locate my email there. And happy to carry on. So thank you. It's fun. <laughs>